Turning Tides is an Antics Entertainment affiliate. You can find us on social media at The Turning Tides Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Turning Tides Pod on Twitter. For more information, or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact us at the turning tides podcast at gmail.com thanks for listening warning this episode of turning tides contains depictions of rape suicide murder genocide war violence racism and abortion mussolini had achieved his lifelong goal he had won the political power he so craved Now he set about laying the foundations for his dictatorship while maintaining the Italian constitution and the king's royal prerogatives. In order to hold his power, he went to work engaging in time-honored Italian political traditions. His cabinet was composed of four fascists, two social democrats, and liberals. It was a blatant display of Italian transformism, which had been practiced in Parliament for approximately 50 years. At the age of 39, Mussolini was the youngest prime minister in Italian history. Mussolini's colleagues often underestimated his political prowess due to this fact. Giolitti and other liberals had always hoped they could manipulate fascism to serve their own ends. Mussolini proved even more calculating and pernicious than the old-school Italian liberals. He had the tacit support of King Victor Emmanuel III. The level of involvement the king had in state affairs is still unknown. Christopher Duggan says that, to this day, quote, the Savoy archives remain firmly closed, unquote. This fact demonstrates how far world leaders are willing to go to hide unsavory information and events from their people in order to keep their own faces clean. Regardless, Mussolini set about creating the fascist state and disseminating fascist ideology throughout Italy, utilizing extensive propaganda and force. He said in his first address to Parliament, quote, The revolution of the black shirts was a force for development, progress, and stability, unquote. He added he could have turned, quote, This grim, gray chamber into a bivouac for soldiers, unquote. Mussolini began his premiership by asserting himself as the head of the interior and foreign ministries, cabinet positions which had previously been held by other domineering premiers, including Mussolini's idol, Francesco Crispi. Many famous liberals were converting to the hard right in a spineless attempt to maintain their positions. Senator Luigi Albertini said, quote, Mussolini has given to the government freshness, youth, and vigor. He has saved Italy from the socialist danger which has been poisoning our life for 20 years, unquote. Meanwhile, Benedetto Croci, Italy's leading intellectual, gave his full support to Mussolini's early fascist regime. Following World War II, Croci would argue that fascism was a foreign import to Italy, And for that reason, Italy should not be harshly judged by the Allies. Giolitti was finally coming to the realization that he had made a terrible mistake when he had given his support to the fascist squadristi. He was now attempting to create a party of national unity to stand up to fascism in the coming elections. In the face of this opposition... Mussolini slowly began his destruction of Italian democracy. Dennis Mack Smith says, quote, Gradually, during 1923 and thereafter, prefectures, police officers, and the state administration were restaffed with fascists. Unquote. Mussolini maintained his attacks on parliament, liberty, and socialism. He compared the revolution in Russia with his march on Rome 
saying, quote, Moscow gives the impression of a terrible leap forwards and a resulting broken neck. Rome gives the impression of a march of compact legions. Unquote. Next, Mussolini targeted other paramilitary organizations and army units. The nationalist blue shirts were disbanded, as were the royal guards of the king. This led to some street fighting and killings, but little protest was made, and there was virtually no opposition. Now, the fascist militias, which were under the command of Mussolini, protected the king and helped enforce law and order. The militia was also granted control of the increasingly disloyal squadristi. This helped to curtail the unchecked violence the squadristi were committing, while also ensuring that local fascist warlords, or Raz, were removed and replaced with, you guessed it, Mussolini. After this, Mussolini's government created the Grand Council of Fascism. This was a consultive body which held the same political weight as the cabinet. In another power move, Mussolini met with Vatican officials in secret and agreed to alter several of the fascist party's anti-clerical stances. In return, the Pope would not support the Italian Catholic Party in the coming election. This blatant draining of the swamp allowed Mussolini to become a dictator who had absolute control of his government and, by extension, the Italian people. Mussolini's foreign policy was just as atrocious. In late August of 1923, an Italian land commission, which was surveying northern Greece at the time, was murdered under mysterious circumstances. It is believed that the commission was attacked and killed by Albanian citizens, but Mussolini used this incident to justify sending an ultimatum to Greece. Italy demanded an apology, an indemnity, and a state funeral, which was to be held in Athens. Greece refused these aggressive demands, and Mussolini dispatched several warships to formally occupy the island of Corfu. The Italian naval squadron arrived fashionably late, and rather than wait for the island's formal surrender, the Italian commodore ordered his ships to fire on the island's fortifications. Inside the fortress were thousands of Armenian refugees. They had escaped genocide in Turkey only to be massacred by Italian naval shells in Greece. France and Britain formed a solid front against Italian aggression, and Italy backed down. Greece had to pay an indemnity in the end, but Italy never got the island of Corfu. Antonio Salandra said the Corfu incident, quote, increased the prestige of Italy's name, unquote. Just in time for the 1924 elections, Mussolini managed to pass the Acerbo Law, this law stated that any party which received at least 25% of the vote would be given an automatic two-thirds majority. 25 is apparently equal to 66 in fashy math. I wish my paycheck used the same algorithm. The Popolari, or the Catholic Party, were voicing serious opposition, but pressure from the Vatican forced the head of the Popolari to resign. As a result, the Catholic Party began to steadily disintegrate. Parliament would vote 303 to 140 for the Acerbo Electoral Law. On that same day, black-shirt fascists patrolled the halls of Parliament, cleaning their pistols and picking their fingers with their daggers. One group which remained defiant was the Socialists, the hundred-odd members had chosen to abstain from voting or vote against Mussolini entirely. Amongst them was Giacomo Matteotti, who had recently become the leader of the reformist socialists after Turati. The 1924 elections were chaotic and corrupt. There were countless instances of voter fraud, intimidation, and murder at the polls. Unsurprisingly, the government-backed candidates, or Listone, won with an overwhelming majority. Italy was now essentially a one-party state. However, 
there were still over 130 members of parliament who belonged to a variety of opposing parties. They were unable to come together and form a cohesive defense against fascism. Matteotti was one of those disparate opposition candidates. He rose to speak to Parliament on May 30th and said, quote, We have a proposal from the Committee for Elections to confirm numerous colleges. We are opposed to this proposal, unquote. Fascists were shaking their fists and berating the young lawyer from Rovigno, but he calmly waited for their vocal attacks to subside. He continued, quote, because if the government has obtained four million votes, we know that this is the consequence of obscene violence, unquote. The most rabid of the fascists were now trying to hurl themselves at Matteotti. He refused to yield his time. He said, quote, The leader of fascism has himself explicitly declared that the government did not consider its fate as tied to the outcome of the elections. Even if it had been a minority, it would have remained in power, unquote. Utter tumult ensued. Amid the shouting, a fascist yelled, quote, We will teach you to respect us by kicking you or shooting you in the back, unquote. Matteotti continued his protest, quote, To support these government proposals, there is an armed militia, which is not at the service of the state, nor at the service of the country, but at the service of the party, unquote. Fascists demanded Matteotti be thrown out of the hall, but he continued, quote, You want to hurl the country backwards toward absolutism. We defend the free sovereignty of the Italian people, to whom we offer our salute, and whose dignity we will defend by demanding that light be shed on the elections, unquote. Before concluding, Matteotti turned to his socialist colleagues, who were in an uproar of enthusiastic support. He said, quote, And now, you can prepare my funeral oration. Unquote. Mussolini was furious that this dissident would dare attempt to stand in the way of his new Italy. Additionally, he feared Matteotti would release an expose detailing the corruption within the fascist party and release it to the foreign press. One example of the vast corruption within the fascist government was that leaders of the party were accepting massive bribes from Sinclair Oil for exclusive petroleum distribution rights in Italy. This type of scandal had the potential to ruin Mussolini's reign, as the king or opposition parties might deem it necessary to intervene upon hearing the sick truth. And public opinion of Mussolini would be forever tarnished, making it more difficult for him to hold power. Mussolini turned to a leading fascist and known murderer and arsonist, Amerigo de Muni. He embezzled millions of dollars, which were siphoned from military contracts that were given to Yugoslavia, and he had a vested interest in seeing Matteotti disappear. On June 10, 1924, five men, led by De Muni, forced Matteotti into the back of a car, and in the ensuing struggle, stabbed him to death. They would leave the young socialist's body in a shallow ditch outside of Rome, and it would not be discovered for months. Mussolini made it abundantly and evidently clear what would happen if someone attempted to defy him. When the press discovered that Mussolini and his administration were involved in the assassination of Matteotti, it nearly brought about the downfall of fascism. Hundreds of parliamentary deputies boycotted parliament in what is remembered as the Aventine Secession. The king could have stepped in, and he would have likely had support from the wavering benches of the fascists. Instead, he did nothing. In parliament, Mussolini threw down the gauntlet. He dared the legislative body to formally impeach him. He said, quote, Here, in front of this assembly and in front of the entire Italian nation, I declare that I, and I alone, assume political, moral, and historical responsibility for all that has happened. 
If some more or less garbled comments are enough to hang a man, then bring out the gibbet and the rope. If fascism has simply been castor oil and manganello, which is a heavy club, and not the magnificent passion of the very flower of Italian youth, the fault is mine. If fascism has been a criminal association, I am the head of that criminal association. You can be certain that in 48 hours following my speech, the situation on every front will be clarified. We all know that I am driven neither by personal caprice, nor by love of power, nor by ignoble passion, but solely by a strong and boundless love for the fatherland. Unquote. Within 48 hours, Italy devolved into a fascist state, just as Mussolini foretold. Christopher Duggan says, quote, The opposition groups lingered on for some months, but they were little more than voices crying in the wilderness. Unquote. Following an assassination attempt on Mussolini, the reformist socialists were officially banned as a political party. When Catholic Party deputies attempted to return to Parliament, they were run off by armed fascists. In October, following another assassination attempt, all opposing parties were banned. In less than five years, the fascist party had gone from being a small, radically nationalistic association to being the only political party in the Kingdom of Italy. During the Matteotti crisis, two fascists had to resign. Several fascists were sentenced to two years in prison, while Dumuni got a healthy sum of lire from the state until it eventually collapsed. At around the same time, the young prince of Ethiopia was in Italy. His name was Tafari, but history remembers him by the name he chose when he ascended as emperor Haile Selassie I. At the time, he was in Rome seeking entrance into the newly formed League of Nations. Mussolini was planning to introduce Ethiopia into the League of Nations, in the hopes of quote-unquote claiming Ethiopia for himself later on. Selassie and Mussolini were different in every way imaginable, save for their height, as they both stood at five foot four inches tall. Selassie was born into nobility. He was the son of Raz Makonin, one of the Ethiopian heroes of the Battle of Adwa, while Mussolini was born a peasant. Selassie was deeply committed to his Orthodox Christian faith, while Mussolini was an avowed atheist. Selassie was a devoted husband who doted on his wife. Mussolini bragged about his numerous affairs and would often sleep with the women in his office. Additionally, Selassie was serious and often described as looking melancholy, while Mussolini was a braggadocious blowhard. These differences would eventually prove too great, and Mussolini would attempt to bring violence on Ethiopia unprovoked. As Mussolini's power grew, he sought to replace the mayors of towns and provinces with podestas. These were, almost always, hand-picked fascist yes-men. In 1925, Mussolini revised the constitution even further. It now stated that the prime minister was subordinate only to the king, who was conveniently operating under Mussolini's iron fist. The next year, Mussolini was given the power to enact laws without parliamentary approval. In time, Mussolini would decree 100,000 laws, sending Italy into complete political and legal chaos. In addition to these new laws, draconian punishments were doled out to those who were suspected of subversive activity. Those found guilty by a military tribunal would find themselves exiled to the Deep South for five years. In the most extreme cases, those accused even faced the death penalty. One place which remained outside of the grasp of the fascist regime was Sicily. There, local mafiosos still ran things, although they paid lip service to fascism. During a visit to Sicily, Mussolini became furious with the conduct of the local mafioso who was also the mayor. 
These men of honor were attempting to run a state within a state, but that was the fascist party's job. As Mussolini railed against Sicilian mafioso and made several attempts to curtail the secret organization, fascists in Florence were committing murder at an increasing rate. This infuriated Mussolini, who demanded order, especially now that he was in control. Mussolini had to rein in his ultra-violent party mates once more, and in 1928 he took authoritarian rule to a new level in Italy. A new law presented a list of fascist candidates, which would either be accepted or rejected en masse by voters. There was no pretending anymore that democracy still existed in Italy. Hundreds of fascist senators were sworn in, they blustered through the halls shouting fascist slogans and sufficiently bullied any remaining old-school liberals into silence. As these laws passed, Mussolini set about purging the fascist party of those he considered undesirable or too popular. He would later complain that the yes-men and spineless fools he put in charge were letting him down, at which Dennis Mack Smith says, quote, The answer must be, that he had the subordinates he deserved and whom he had himself advanced." Unquote. Mussolini had a disparaging view of almost everyone. He referred to his administration as, quote, Cretans, but obedient Cretans, unquote. Among these Cretans was Emilio di Bono, Italo Balbo, and Galazio Ciano. The first was a mediocre army general who would go on to lead mediocre advances into Ethiopia in a few years' time. Balbo was the head of the fascist militia and probably the most liked fascist outside of Italy. In 1937, the Italian Air Force landed in Chicago and one million residents came to greet him. The city even named a street after him. Balbo Drive is still there today. Balbo would die in a friendly fire incident at the start of World War II when his plane was shot down by Italian anti-aircraft guns. Some historians speculate, with good reason, that this was ordered by Mussolini, who feared Balbo's popularity, although no tangible evidence exists to support that claim. Finally, Ciano was a rich boy who flaunted his money, but he was also a quick wit and would eventually find himself as Mussolini's son-in-law. Unfortunately for him, this would not spare him. In 1944, Ciano was shot in the back of the neck for betraying Mussolini after voting for his ousting. The most well-known fascist economic system was the corporatist system. This was designed to regulate the national economy. A branch of industry or agriculture was placed in one of 22 separate categories or umbrellas. Fascist party leaders were in charge of managing these umbrellas. They adjusted figures, increased production, and instituted reforms. Mussolini hoped that one day these umbrellas of his corporatist system would replace the functions of parliament. In reality, the corporatist system was a hopelessly muddled mess. Mussolini had created a new level of state bureaucracy, which made corruption essential. There are countless examples detailing this fact. The town of Panza had no running water at the height of World War II because the funds for the aqueduct were pocketed by fascist party members. Industrial zones were fabricated with the sole purpose of profiting off state subsidies, and factories were even erected as a front to fool the state. Instead of addressing the corruption within his own ranks and taking responsibility for the failures of his administration, Mussolini turned outward and blamed the southerner or the foreigner for Italy's backslide into economic stagnation. The cracks in Mussolini's reign became apparent when he had to revalue the lire, which forced many citizens to sell their family farms. Mussolini then declared a battle for grain insisting that grain not be imported, only grown and harvested in Italy. This served to increase the earnings of the ultra-rich, who could afford to grow vast swathes of grain while putting most small farms out of business. 
When the Great Depression struck, Italian peasants were already starving. At the same time, in Sicily, there were several mock trials of mafioso, but this did nothing to improve the situation in southern Italy. In fact, it probably made it worse. The fascist Podesta was disinclined to report the actual number of crimes occurring, as it would go against the propaganda the fascist party was pushing, which stated that they had defeated the mafia. The mafia may have gone into hiding for a time, but they were never truly defeated. Come World War II, the mafia would play a central role in the Allied invasion of Sicily. Fascist lawmakers began to solidify Italy's fascist identity. They believed in having, quote, few schools but good ones. This belief was formed in response to the extraordinary number of university graduates who were not able to find work. These numbers had shot up following the Great War. So fascists endeavored to disenfranchise lower and lower middle class children, not allowing them to seek an education which was, quote, above their station, unquote. Education was retooled to focus on traditional studies, Latin, history, and philosophy, with a special emphasis on founding fascist myths. Science and math were deemed, quote, too cosmopolitan, unquote, so schools refused to focus on these subjects. Women were also ostracized and had a new curriculum created for them specifically. Instead of learning of Italy's glorious past, women learned how to knit, cook, and dance. In 1925, a new law decreed that teachers could be forced into retirement if they espoused views contrary to fascist ideology. In 1929, all public employees were required to be a member of the fascist party. Teachers were instructed to prepare their pupils for, quote, service to the fatherland, unquote. The first words taught to Italian children in school were Benito, Fascismo, and Duce. Teachers were made to swear an oath of allegiance to the state, but many did this while retaining their own political liberalism, hoping to keep fascist dogma out of the classroom and away from young minds. They largely succeeded at this, likely saving millions of children from being brainwashed into obedience to an unfair system. During the same year, Vatican City and the fascist state had reached a concordance. The Vatican would finally acknowledge the Kingdom of Italy, if the country made Roman Catholicism the state religion. Although Mussolini was an atheist, he understood that without the support of the Vatican, his retooling of Italian society would not get very far. Religion would play a central role in fascism from this point forward, and the Vatican would celebrate the birthdays of Mussolini and Hitler until their deaths. As tensions between the Allies and Italy ramped up, traditional authors like Ibsen, Tolstoy, and Hugo were replaced with nationalist, racist writers like D'Annunzio. As war broke out in Ethiopia, Racism became commonplace across Italy. The story of the white soul of Black John illustrates this perfectly. An African boy is taken from his country, and when he arrives in Italy, he is shown off to Italian children. His abductor, a Catholic priest, says the boy, quote, went about nude and ate raw meat, unquote. But due to Italian schooling and the Roman Catholic religion, he had become, quote, civilized and Christian, Unquote. Fascist schooling had proved counterintuitive, hazardous to children, and ineffective. By 1938, the massive surplus of college graduates had not subsided, but had actually increased. Mussolini claimed that foreigners viewed Italians, quote, not as a race, but a cowardly mishmash of men and women best known for serving and entertaining people abroad, unquote. The fascist state intended to change this stigma. This would be accomplished through a push for physical exercise and involvement in group sports. In 1926, the Opera Nazionale Balilla was founded and designed in order to control the physical education of children. 
For boys, these institutions were designed to mold them into soldiers and warriors, while the girls were taught how to be good mothers and homemakers. Camping became an essential activity as it mimicked the hardships that would befall future soldiers as they were deployed away from home. Sports of all types became exceedingly popular. In boxing, Primo Carnera, a six-foot-seven giant of a man, was destroying his opponents in repeated bouts. It soon became illegal for journalists to photograph him on his back. However, the most popular and longest-lasting fascist addition to Italy was soccer or football. It was considered the most fascist sport besides rugby, since it combined individualism with team play. The sport grew a rabid fan base in no time at all. In 1934, Rome hosted the World Cup, and in the final match, Italy squared off with Czechoslovakia. It became a battle about politics as much as a sporting event, since the Czechoslovak nation was by far the freest in Central Europe. In the end, Italy won the game, and this somehow proved to those in attendance that fascism was the superior form of government. Italy would secure the World Cup again in 1938, this time defeating the French national team. In a large way, Italy's reputation did change, but not for the better. The bellicose nature of Italian rhetoric deterred tourists from venturing there and exports were steadily falling thanks to Mussolini's belief in autarky. Under fascism, millions suffered, and the few at the top benefited. As the 1930s began, New Italy looked exceedingly like the old one. The state imported 500 million lire of wheat just to feed its population. To counter this irreconcilable situation, Mussolini endeavored to reclaim thousands of acres of swampland, as well as reforesting the Apenninis. These were largely successful projects, but World War II destroyed most of them, as Mussolini began drifting toward imperialism. The one thing Italians could do was leave. Unfortunately, checks on emigration were pervading the Americas, in 1924, the United States Congress passed a law which allowed for fewer than 4,000 migrants from Italy a year. The poorest citizens had nowhere they could go, and immigration now flowed from southern Italy to the north, with many making a home in the major cities. Mussolini did not approve of this and continued to force Italy into maintaining its status as an agricultural nation. The lack of escape for poorer Italians became detrimental to Italy's economy. These effects were slightly offset by the declining birth rate, which Mussolini also considered a major issue. He waged a, quote, battle for births, unquote, and endeavored to increase the Italian population to over 60 million by 1960. It was considered a, quote, crime against the race, unquote, to administer an abortion or dispense birth control. Dennis Mack Smith says, quote, When the incredulous asked how such a number could live in Italy, the reply came that they would live because they could not die, adding that such questions revealed a weary and anemic mentality, unquote. Marriage became subsidized by the state, while single people were disproportionately taxed and ostracized from jobs and promotions in favor of families with a large brood. The results of Mussolini's war on birth were underwhelming, to say the least. 1932 was the only year in Italian history in which fewer than a million babies were born, save for 1876, and the years that passed during the Great War. In the words of Christopher Duggan, quote, Once again, the gap between ideal and reality, expectation and reality, was proving frustratingly hard to bridge, unquote. Fascist doctrine was built on the belief that, quote, the state is all-embracing, 
and no human or spiritual values can exist outside the state, unquote. They were against secret societies like the Freemasons, as well as individualistic expression. Fascists fully embraced their own form of quote-unquote mysticism, and even had a quote, school of mysticism, unquote, in Milan, in which students debated the higher theories of fascism. At the end of the day, Mussolini was the final word on fascist dogma. Professors and intellectuals were explicitly told not to put their own reasoning to use when discussing Mussolini's words, because the difference between the average intellectual and Mussolini's genius was apparently, quote, a simply astronomical gap, unquote. I'm sure that's true, but not in the way Mussolini imagined. Attempts were made to emulate and revere the Roman Empire. Archaeological digs around Rome helped uncover parts of the ancient Roman Forum, and heroes of the Risorgimento were beatified by the fascist state. Statues honoring Giuseppe and Anita Garibaldi sprang up all over Italy. Odd that Mussolini honored a man who likely would have punched him in the mouth if he were a contemporary. In time, the Garibaldi brigades of the Italian anti-fascist partisans would bring the fight to Mussolini's regime in honor of their namesake. Within the realm of art and culture, the total control of the fascist state turned Italy into an artistic backwater. German-influenced design was swamping Italy while traditional forms of Italian artistic expression were dulled to favor the cult of the Duce or to uphold fascist myths. Propaganda was the new so-called art in Italy. Numerous pamphlets, books, news articles, and manufactured celebrations were used to show that fascist Italy was, quote, at the forefront of the world, unquote. Physics and math were highly regulated, and were only used to show how much Italy had grown under fascism. By far, the most well-known Italian intellectual of the time was Benedetto Croci. At first, he collaborated with fascism, but as time went on, he grew more wary and critical of the regime. Being known the world over, Croci could not simply disappear, like Mussolini's socialist enemies had. He was allowed relative freedom until the end of the regime. By that time, Croce would identify as an avowed anti-fascist, like most of Italy. As the 1930s began, the Great Depression racked Italy, and the fascist regime turned more and more toward the persecution of the other. Dennis Mack Smith says, quote, Fascism exalted brutality into an officially imposed creed, and the police did not usually interfere when the squads were on a weekend spree, unquote. As early as 1926, Mussolini had created OVRA, or the Organization for Vigilance and Repression of Anti-Fascism. This acted as the secret police of the fascist party and the state. Italian fascism proved to not be as murderous as the authoritarian communism of Stalin's USSR, nor the genocidal Nazi regime in Germany, mostly because its leaders were inept and careless. The head of OVRA claimed that there were as many as 20 separate police forces, which were against each other and did not coordinate policy. There were Italian citizens who chose to exile themselves rather than see their country destroyed by fascism. But Mussolini did not stop at Italian borders. He continued to keep tabs on these subversives. These were the diehards who had been against Mussolini from the beginning. There were socialists, communists, liberals, and Catholic Party members who all despised the route their country had taken. Amongst them was Carlo Rosselli. He became interested in politics following the assassination of Matteotti. Rosselli had exiled himself to Paris, where many Italian anti-fascists were gathering and conspiring. In 1926, Rosselli, alongside the future Prime Minister Ferruccio Pari, embarked on a daring nighttime raid. 
the former head of the reformist socialists, Turati, was living under fascist surveillance on a Mediterranean island. Rosselli and Paris smuggled Turati to Corsica. In 1929, Rosselli managed a similar feat at the Lipari Islands and freed many political prisoners. In Paris, he edited the anti-fascist political journal Justice and Liberty. All the while, Mussolini was assigning agent provocateurs to monitor the opposition. In 1937, a squad of French fascists, under direct orders from Mussolini, cornered Rosselli and his brother in a French resort town and gunned them both down. It was one of a hundred different yet similar stories. In Italy, ethnic persecution began with the native Germans living in the Alto Adige, which the country had claimed during the First World War. Fascism decreed that there was no minority in Italy, only Italians. So German names of towns and businesses had to change. The Vatican was fully on the fascist side. German abbots had to give way to name changes or face the consequences. Hitler stepped in, and after a series of talks, the Germans of Italy were given a choice. Emigrate to Germany or submit to Italian assimilation efforts. 70,000 chose to leave. Slavs in Italy were treated much more cruelly. Slav inscriptions on churches and headstones were desecrated and removed. The Bishop of Trieste dared to stand up to this fascist xenophobia, and the Vatican dutifully removed the troublemaker. By 1938, with war bells ringing across the world, French speakers in the Val d'Aosta Valley were forcibly Italianized. When the tides eventually turned for Italy, these battered French and Slavic peoples would seek vengeance. Besides these European ethnic minorities and zealous anti-fascists, few in Italy voiced opposition to Mussolini's regime. Dennis Max Smith contends, quote, Up to 1936, support for Mussolini grew rather than diminished. Consciences were gradually dulled as people were driven from one small connivance to another. Once the first surrender had been made, there was no point of retreat, no unviolated principle worth a battle, until the means of opposition no longer existed. It was enough that Mussolini could fool most of the people most of the time. Unquote. The liberals, the press, educators, the king, and now the people had submitted meekly to Mussolini. Unable to control himself, he looked toward the horizon and saw a vision of a new Roman Empire. It ran down the Nile, into the heart of Africa, across the Mediterranean, and into the Middle East. Throughout the 1920s and early 1930s, the interior of Libya was pacified by the Italian military. They were the first to use tanks in the desert, although their tin plating caused many tank operators to collapse from heat stroke. It was here where Italians first began using poison gas against the native peoples in the area. It had devastating effects, and the handful of Bedouins not in concentration camps were annihilated after an intense resistance. Those Libyans found with weapons were shot on sight. Up to 50% of the native Libyan population was killed or displaced. Of 100,000 interred in concentration camps, 40,000 would perish. One of the main perpetrators of this genocide was Rodolfo Graziani. He would gain the apt nickname of the Butcher of Fezzan after the countless he murdered on the road to quote-unquote glory. He would go on to kill hundreds of thousands of Ethiopians. One exiled Libyan wrote aptly, quote, Thanks to your military equipment, you have succeeded in conquering a country after a war waged in our midst for 22 years. But I can tell you that you have not conquered a single heart amongst the people of Tripoli. For hearts are not like forts. They are not captured with bombs, but are won over with justice and good deeds, 
Unquote. Following the Battle of Adwa in 1896, Ethiopia became the only independent nation in Africa to be recognized by the other world powers as a sovereign country. It was an immense achievement, but conservative and clerical forces in Ethiopia were attempting to halt modernization. Emperor Menelik was growing tired, and by 1913, on the eve of World War I, he would pass away. His last words were, quote, My poor people, unquote. Perhaps he saw what was in store for the Empire of Ethiopia, which claimed a lineage dating back to the times of King Solomon and Queen Sheba. Menelik's crown prince was Li Jiasu. He was a debauched man who cared little for statecraft. In time, he was usurped by Menelik's clerical daughter, Ziuditu. She built many churches, but did little to improve her people's living conditions, as enslavement was legal in Ethiopia until 1942. The vast majority of the people lived in tukuls, which were little more than clay huts with tin roofs. Disease, malnourishment, and rebellion were rampant. When Ziuditu died in 1930, the job of ruling the multi-ethnic African country fell to Prince Tafari. He took the name Haile Selassie, which means the power of the Trinity in Amharan. He immediately faced a modernizing world full of obstacles. Besides the internal problems his nation faced, Selassie was surrounded on all sides by an opportunistic France, an apathetic Britain, and a bellicose Italy. Italian policy had been one of encroachment. They would raise local African militias known as Bond and purposefully occupy Ethiopian territory in the hopes that Ethiopia would respond, giving Italy pretext for an invasion. Ethiopia was in the process of finalizing a land survey in order to gain access to a British port in British Somaliland. The small number of Ethiopian army units accompanying the surveyors were intent on not allowing Italian troops into their territory. More Ethiopian soldiers were called up, and a hostile stalemate developed between the two camps. Supposedly, the battle began when an Ethiopian soldier tossed a chicken bone at the African troops in Italian employ. Words escalated to blows, which escalated to a full-on battle. Italian machine guns cut apart Ethiopian soldiers, who made the tactical error of not deploying their own machine guns in practical locations. The stage was set and the pretext given. Italy was now on the war path against Ethiopia. This war was intended to, quote, correct the failures of the past, unquote, and avenge the Italians who died at Adwa. Italy's intentions were made abundantly clear in April at the Stressa Conference. This was a conference for the victorious powers of World War I, Italy, Great Britain, and France. It was held in the hopes of these three powers forming a united front against Germany. At the time, Italy considered Austria a part of its sphere of influence, and German encroachment on Austria deeply upset Mussolini. He was prepared to go to war with Hitler, going as far as deploying an army to the Brenner Pass. Hitler backed down, but Mussolini wanted assurances from the other world powers that they would uphold the peace amongst League members. At Stressa, Britain and France wanted to keep Italy happy and on the Allies' good side. Both countries' diplomats remained silent when Mussolini amended the proposal of the conference. Now it read that the conference members would join together only if the, quote, peace of Europe, unquote, was in danger. Ethiopia was left out to dry, just as Czechoslovakia would be in 1938. This was done in the hopes of appeasing a bully. Troops, tanks, planes, cars, ammunition, artillery, and poison gas were all being deployed into Italian Eritrea and Somaliland. In Great Britain, the people were decidedly on the side of Ethiopia. 
They saw the country as an underdog and wanted to do anything they could to support them. Unfortunately, Tory leadership was vapid and useless. When Labour MPs demanded the Suez Canal be closed to any aggressive nation, Tory leaders responded by banning arms exports to Italy and Ethiopia. This only hurt Ethiopia, as Italy had been building up its forces for years and wasn't in need of imported weapons. In May, Italy was bribing Ethiopian nobility. They wanted to find a rat who would jump ship. They found their traitor in Haile Selassie Gugsa. On the Italian side, preparations were being made for an offensive, which would attack Ethiopia's Tigray region in the northwest. General Emile de Bono, one of the orchestrators of the Mattiotti assassination, would lead it. Emperor Selassie refused to order a general mobilization of his troops. He still believed the international community would come to the aid of one of their own. It was a poor choice by the emperor, but he had no reason to believe the League of Nations would not support his country full-heartedly. In June, Stanley, peace at any cost, Baldwin, agreed to allow Germany to create a sizable navy. It was another gesture of acquiescence, which gave Mussolini more political ammo for his coming invasion. Celesi turned to the American ambassador and asked if his country could help. Celesi was promising American businesses rights to mineral and oil drilling in his country if they could step in and prevent the coming war. However, FDR's America was still suffering from the Great Depression, as well as from intense isolationism in Congress. Ethiopia would be shunned once more. Black Americans were losing their patience. There were mass rallies in support of Ethiopia across the country. In Harlem, upwards of 5,000 black and African men enlisted in ad hoc volunteer armies, which were determined to fight in Ethiopia. 50,000 black Americans were ready to fight, but they were barred repeatedly by the State Department and threatened with jail time and having their citizenship revoked. As a result, few served there, but they continued the fight for Ethiopia at home, promoting Italian boycotts and keeping the news from Ethiopia flowing. Racial tension, which was only exacerbated by the conflict, spilled over several times in New York City which contains a large population of both black and Italian Americans. Throughout the war, there were instances of Italian businesses being attacked and demonstrations turning into riots. When Primo Carnera went up against Joe Louis, the fight was advertised and hyped along these same racial lines. When Carnera was easily dispatched by Louis, it brought heart to millions who hoped for a repeat of the fight on the battlefields of Ethiopia. Haile Selassie had his back against the wall. His country had few resources, little technology, and a fatally optimistic population. Those who still remembered Adwa said there was no way Ethiopia could be beaten by a European army. When asked how they would counter aircraft, Ethiopian soldiers said the prayers of their priests would ward off the plains. Haile Selassie was attempting to unite his country against a common enemy, but the scars of civil war were deep in Ethiopia. The country was forged through war and conquest, and over the bodies of perhaps millions of the disparate peoples of the area. Haile Selassie still enjoyed the admiration and loyalty of many of the common people, and they gathered in throngs to hear their emperor's plea for unity. Some weapons were arriving from Nazi Germany, of all places. Obviously, Hitler had no love for the Ethiopians, but he was an opportunist, and at that moment, Italy was denying German political advances into Austria. James Pierce concludes, quote, Any white soldier killed in Africa from a German machine gun was one less Italian that could keep him from gobbling up Austria, unquote. As war loomed, the strangest characters began arriving and investing in Ethiopia. They were a motley mix of mercenaries and fame-seekers. In one instance, a Zionist group was looking to buy insurance on the Ark of the Covenant. 
These Zionists were worried the Ethiopians would parade the covenant in front of their armies and therefore incur some Indiana Jones-level type of wrath from God. The covenant was thankfully not paraded and supposedly remained safe, even though the church holding it was bombed several times by the Italian Air Force. European military advisors pervaded the high court and would instruct Ethiopians on the coming war. Haile Selassie was of the opinion that the soldiers should wage a guerrilla war on the Italians and that mobilizing mass armies would only result in their destruction. But he had to appease his Ra's, or dukes, and other influential Ethiopians who wished to wage a traditional war. In Ethiopia's south, the armed forces were attempting to create a defensive line in order to repel the coming Italian invasion. The terrain here would prove a decisive factor in hindering Italian designs. The men stationed here were under the command of Afawark Walda Semayet. He detested all Europeans and saw their influence in the Ethiopian high court as a disgrace. He had a single Orlikon 37 anti-aircraft gun, set against the entire Italian Air Force. He said he would stay on the gun until he died. He continued, quote, The Italians can rob all my country. When I am dead, I shall not care. I shall not know. Unquote. Avowark had set up his frontline camp in less than a month. In the north, it was a totally different story. Around Adwa, Trenches were dug in the fashion of World War I, but they would be totally useless against airplanes, and the infantry within would be annihilated. Military advisors on hand had to plead with the commanders to abandon the useless positions and make for the hills for better defenses. Haile Selassie had no choice but to appoint commanders along feudal lines, which in the end meant his commanders were rarely military men, but instead feckless nobles. On September 29, 1935, Ethiopia finally called for a mass mobilization. The mobilization order declared, quote, All men and boys able to carry a spear go to Addis Ababa. Every married man will bring his wife to cook and wash for him. Every unmarried man will bring any unmarried women he can find to cook and wash for him. Women with babies, the blind, and those too aged and infirm to carry a spear are excused. Anyone found at home after receiving this order will be hanged." Unquote. Three days later, Mussolini shouted these words from the piazza, quote, Black shirts of the revolution, men and women of all Italy, a solemn hour is about to strike the history of the country. Unquote. The Kingdom of Italy was declaring war on Ethiopia. Mussolini called Ethiopia's existence a quote, black injustice, unquote, and said the country was quote, unworthy of ranking among civilized nations. Unquote. For the most part, the people were showing intense adulation with the Duce's decree. But in the rural parts of the country, Many peasants complained. One said, quote, We've got plenty of land right here, but nothing to go with it. Unquote. A small girl was bewildered by the news. She wrote in her diary, quote, The teacher has said that the Duce wants to give Italians a place in the sun. It seems to me we have got plenty of sun in my town. Unquote. In Ethiopia, the shouts came from the scouts outside of the famous town of Adwa. Quote, they are coming. Unquote. It was a squadron of Italian bombers. They had caught the people of the town and its garrison unawares and began a devastating bombing campaign. Modern war had arrived in Ethiopia. Raz Sayum, commander of the Ethiopian forces in the area, cried out, quote, Great God of Ethiopia, what is happening? Unquote. Without a formal declaration of war, hostilities began on October 3rd. Hospitals and Red Cross facilities were not spared and would not be spared in the bombings and gassings to come. On the same day, three columns of 100,000 Italian troops and their native allies under the command of Emilio de Bono advanced across the Mareb River. Road-building engineers 
Light tanks, armored vehicles, and a huge number of pack mules accompanied the march. The Italians met no resistance. This was a deliberate move by the emperor. He wanted the League of Nations to see that Ethiopia was clearly the victim. He tried in vain to get his generals to employ guerrilla tactics against the Italians. Raz Seum replied by telegraph, quote, I am too old and too tired to become a shifter, or a common thief, unquote. Raz Seum was determined to fight a conventional campaign without the necessary equipment to do so. He fell back deep into the country and awaited reinforcements, leaving the towns of Adwa and Adigat to the Italians. This was a boon for Italian morale, and it supposedly erased the 30-year disgrace which had been the Battle of Adwa. In Addis Ababa, the Ethiopians were gathering in the thousands for mobilization. Haile Selassie greeted them, saying, quote, I am happy to see you before me with knives, swords, and rifles. But it is not I alone who knows. It is the whole world outside that knows our Ethiopian soldiers will die for their freedom. Soldiers, I give you this advice, so that we gain victory over the enemy. Be cunning. Be savage. Face the enemy one by one, two by two, five by five, in the fields and mountains. Do not take white clothes. Hide. Strike suddenly. Fight the nomad war. Snipe and kill singly. Today the war has begun. Therefore scatter and advance to victory." Unquote. On the Italian side, Vittorio Mussolini, the Duce's son, was making bombing runs against Ethiopian targets. He said it was, quote, extremely entertaining, unquote, to see groups of Ethiopian soldiers, quote, blooming open like a rose, unquote, when his bombs scored direct hits. But he also felt displeased that his attacks against buildings did not produce, quote, one of those terrific explosions when everything goes sky high. Bombing these thatched mud huts of the Ethiopians doesn't give one the slightest satisfaction. Unquote. The invasion made headlines across the world, and there were numerous protests both for and against Italy's bombardment of Ethiopia. In Britain's Soho district, Oswald Mosley was leading his fascist squads in protests against British involvement. He claimed, quote, Finance, oil, the Jews, and the Reds want war, unquote. Mosley's fascists were unsurprisingly in the pocket of Mussolini. In France, Italians who wanted to return home to serve were attacked by French anti-fascists. In Spain, forces were coalescing to bring the country into a state of civil war, but leftists were clearly on the side of Ethiopia. In Harlem, Black Americans protested in front of a largely Italian-American market. A butcher shop was nearly stormed, while a man who was displaying the Ethiopian tricolor was arrested after he supposedly hit a police officer in the hand with the flagpole. In Brooklyn, it was even worse. Public School 178 had a student body that was largely composed of black and Italian students. A huge fight broke out causing the police to get involved, and when they arrived at the scene, they confiscated all sorts of weapons. Jeff Pierce says the police and school administration were collecting, quote, lead pipes, sawed-off billiard cubes, broom handles, and ice picks, unquote. Early activists like C.L.R. James wrote of the conflict, quote, let us fight not only Italian imperialism, but the other robbers and oppressors. French and British imperialism, unquote. When the League of Nations finally met to discuss sanctions, they agreed to lift the arms embargo against Ethiopia. Too little, too late, since the country was already being invaded and needed the weapons long ago. In the Agaden region on Ethiopia's southern front, the Italian advance was headed by the butcher of Fezzan, Rodolfo Graziani. He said of the coming invasion, quote, The Duce shall have Ethiopia, with the Ethiopians or without them, just as he pleases. Unquote. Graziani was given the job of maintaining this massive front with only a single division at his disposal. To make up for this lack of manpower, 
he brought in huge amounts of armored cars, tanks, and aircraft. First, he struck the 30,000-strong Ethiopian army, which was under the command of Nasibu Zamanuel. Nasibu said the Italians, quote, blanketed a wide area, unquote, with mustard gas. When confronted with their use of mustard gas, Italian diplomats claimed the Ethiopians were using dum-dum bullets, which were likewise banned in international conflict. This was true, but the Ethiopians simply had no other means of equipping their ancient rifles but with exploding ammunition. Also, the Ethiopians were being invaded. They wouldn't need to use banned ammunition if Italian armies weren't there in the first place and if the world hadn't conspired to deny Ethiopia the proper equipment and the means to defend themselves. Regardless, Graziani continued his tenderizing of the front with his aircraft. At Godahai, Afawar Kualda Semayet was still at his anti-aircraft gun, pounding away at any aircraft he could get in his sights. His men were being brutalized by daily bombing campaigns, but he promised to hold on no matter what. In the north, the traitor Gugsa was planning his own maneuver against Makel, which is a key point on the imperial road. This road winds its way through Ethiopia and into Addis Ababa. This would be achieved relatively easily, as the Ethiopians had no troops in the area. However, upon taking Makel, the Italian right was dangerously exposed. Di Bono had no choice but to leave his right flank in this precarious state because Mussolini was hounding him at every turn. He continually pounded away at the telegraph machine, demanding news of glorious victory. Di Bono, for his credit, abolished slavery and provided food and work to those formerly enslaved peoples who sought Italian aid. It's an extraordinary fact that an accomplice to political murder is one of the least evil fascists. He would be replaced by one of Italy's heroes during World War I, Pietro Bedoglio. He had been lobbying for Di Bono's ousting for a while now, but once he took charge, he realized the enormity of the task before him. Haile Selassie was reviewing a grand procession of 80,000 Ethiopian warriors under the command of Raz Mulugeta, hero of Adwa. James Pierce says that there were, quote, barefoot soldiers of the Imperial Guard, a mule train carrying Vickers' guns. There were peasants armed only with sticks and empty cartridge belts, skilled swordsmen flashing their acrobatic skills, warriors who rushed the dais begging for arms, unquote. At noon, the famous Raz was trumpeted in, and he immediately began lecturing his emperor. He told Selassie to expel the foreigners and not trust in their counsel and promises. Following this conversation with Mulugeta, the emperor hastened his troops to the front and promised he would be beside them. The men were anxious and eager to face the Italians. They had heard about the children and women killed at Adwa. One man promised to, quote, drown the baby killers in their own blood, unquote. One older warrior approached the emperor more solemnly. He told him, quote, I have a boy. If I am killed, call him to the army, unquote. Haile Selassie could not help but weep. On every front, news rolled in of looming disaster and also of Italian butchery. The emperor did not allow journalists embedded in Addis Ababa to travel to the front, which ultimately hurt the Ethiopian people, as their struggle was not able to be seen by the rest of the world. Italian and pro-Italian journalists had free reign, so long as they reported favorable news on the Italian military advance. Mussolini needed as much good news as he could get. The Italian state was absolutely sputtering in place. Halfway through October, the country had spent 200 million lire on the war. The Duce's ingenious solution was to just print more money. The League of Nations was ready to impose serious sanctions. They imposed sanctions on Italy in regards to key wartime resources. However, Italy had an ace in the hole. 
it could get almost all of its necessary raw materials from America. America was not a part of the League of Nations, and private interests, namely Standard Oil, prevented American policymakers from imposing sanctions themselves. Back in early 1936, Italy and the League of Nations were in a contentious place, to say the least. The League had to come to the defense of one of their own sworn members, right? Smaller nations, like the Free Irish Republic, voiced their support and war clouds were looming large. Italian garrisons were bolstered in Libya, and the British Mediterranean fleet was greatly reinforced. France, however, was determined to stop the conflict, and they suggested the British pull out of the Mediterranean. This would somehow make Mussolini stand down in Libya. It was strange rationale, but Britain did pull out two of their cruisers, and Mussolini returned the favor by pulling out some troops from Libya. The covenant of the League of Nations was broken. The smaller nations could be gobbled up by the larger. Faith in the international community was deeply shaken for the first of many times in the years to come. Affelwark kept up his anti-aircraft fire this whole time, never abandoning his post. He ate his meals with a piece of Italian shrapnel. He was clearly serious when he said he would die fighting there. He had been wounded in the leg and it was festering, but he refused to leave. Ethiopian tradition dictates that when your commander was wounded or killed, you were obliged to bury him or seek treatment for him. George Steer says Afawark's wound had become gangrenous and he, quote, could scarcely crawl, unquote. The planes kept coming, and Afawark continued his violent vigil until he slumped back in his aircraft gun, unconscious. He would die on the way to the hospital, and losing his example, his men faltered and retreated from their positions. As Italians pursued them, they came upon reinforcing Ethiopians, and a deadly fight ensued along a dry riverbed near Anale. It was a severe blow for the southern Italian push, Graziani had to halt operations for months to recover from what he claimed was a victory. The Italians had moved first, and they had succeeded in their initial objectives. They were in for a rude awakening, as the Ethiopians would respond with an offensive of their own, aimed at crippling the northern Italian foothold. Razmulugeta's 80,000 were marching north in Gondor, Raz Kassa had raised a formidable host of 160,000, while Raz Imru had a modest force of 25,000 attempting to link up with a further 10,000 near the Italian-Eritrean border. On November 12th, at End Gorge, 2,000 mostly African Italian allies were set upon by about 5,000 well-led Ethiopians. The ambush was total, and the acoustics of the gorge made it sound as though Ethiopian bullets were coming from all directions. When they ran out of bullets, the Ethiopians charged with reckless abandon. They were decimated by grenades and repeated Askari, which were African soldiers loyal to Italy, bayonet charges. For seven hours, the fight continued in this fashion. The Italians were sure that the morning would bring their decimation, Instead, the Ethiopians had departed. It was tradition in Ethiopia not to fight at night, nor to fight for a second day. As the Battle of End Gorge ended anticlimactically, Razmulugeta was marching his men toward confrontation. He rose at dawn and demanded 25 miles a day as his marching speed. He tore a path through Ethiopia, disobeying his emperor's orders not to loot the peasantry. His destination was Amba Aradam, where he would hold the Italians using a 9,000-foot-tall mountain. At the same time, Raz Kassa was moving his men along an ancient caravan route, destined for Amba Alagi, where he would combine with Raz Seyum's men. The emperor, meanwhile, had made a headquarters closer to the northern front in the town of Desi, in the garden he made good use of an Olerkan anti-aircraft gun. He was on hand when Italian aircraft killed 50 innocent civilians and wounded a further 200. 
One place that was targeted especially by Italian air power was the town's Red Cross facility. As war raged in Ethiopia, politicians in Paris and London bickered about the best way to end it. The or laval Pact was a secret deal offered to Mussolini. It promised a vast majority of Ethiopia to Italy. In effect, this would have awarded the aggressor for starting a war. Ethiopian officials were never informed of the treaty's contents and found the terms incredulous and pointless. Italy and Ethiopia were already at war. What was needed was backing from the international community on the side of the invaded. Most people were demanding their government do something to stop this unprovoked invasion. The people in charge, however, were spineless liberals, centrists, and conservatives who were horrified to think about what a new war would bring. They failed to realize that sometimes, to stop a bully, you have to stand up to them. This was just what the Ethiopians were doing on the northern front, with or without international support. In the province of Gander, Raz Imru was planning an assault on Mai Timchet to fool the Italian planes. He sent small detachments of men on daytime marches in the opposite direction of the town. After crossing the Tekaze River, Ethiopians silently dispatched a detachment of Eskari manning an old stone fort. Imru now controlled the only line of retreat to Adua for many miles, the Dembugina Pass. The Italians realized they had fallen into some sort of trap, and they dispatched a tank column to clear the pass with their machine guns. An Ethiopian warrior worked his way behind the lead tank, climbed it, and demanded the operator open up. The operator foolishly did so, and he was decapitated by the warrior's sword. Seeing this, the Italian column panicked. Blackshirt militias attempted to zoom forward in their trucks, only to face a withering crossfire from both sides of the pass. The other tanks limbered forward, but the Ethiopians showed no fear, and the Italians were swarmed, unable to maneuver. Ethiopians ripped out the tank operators and executed them. To buy time, the Italian commander launched his African troops in a suicidal bayonet charge. At day's end, nearly half the Italian column were dead or dying. The Battle of Dembugina Pass was a clear victory for the Ethiopians. It proved Italian generals had still not learned how to adequately counter guerrilla tactics. James Pierce says, quote, Against all odds, the Ethiopians were actually turning the tide. Bedoglio had to stop that, so he changed the entire character of the war, introducing a new viciousness and barbarity that would cause fresh outrage around the world. Unquote. In the face of economic sanctions, Italians rallied around the Duce. Mussolini manipulated public opinion so that Italians believed they were being the ones persecuted. He pleaded with the Italian people, claiming the country needed gold. Married Italian women arrived to greet the Duce in droves to give up their wedding rings. In return, the woman received an iron ring, which symbolized her commitment to the war. It wasn't just gold. Scrap iron and silver were collected en masse in small communities across Italy. Surprisingly, many busts and statues of Mussolini were melted down to fund the war effort. All this time, the Italian strategy was made abundantly clear. First, bomb and gas anything that moved. Second, send your African Ascari troops in as cannon fodder to suffer and die. Finally, claim glory for Italy. Consequently, many of these Ascari units became elite and began to catch wise of their second-tier treatment by their European commanders. Droves were defecting to the Ethiopian side, and by the end of the Italian occupation, Eritrean defects would make up a crucial part of the Ethiopian resistance movement. Additionally, regular army units and the black shirt militias were separate military entities. These two branches had a poor relationship, to say the least, and this greatly affected army cohesion. 
Badoglio was in disbelief. He had a true fight on his hands. The Ethiopians on his left could capture his supply base in Adikala and invade Eritrea. The combined forces of Ras Kassa and Seyu, meanwhile, were preparing to tear into the Italian right. And to his front, the mountain stronghold of Ras Mulugeta's forces were preparing to make raids along the Italian lines of retreat. On December 22nd, the Ethiopians moved in force toward Abi Adi. Ascari and Italian units stationed there were awoken by a tidal wave of Ethiopian warriors. Artillery was ordered to fire point-blank on charging Ethiopians, blowing apart countless attackers. The Ethiopians refused to stop. Artillerymen were now using their rifles and pistols to hold back the swarming soldiers. The order to retreat was given, and as the Italians fell back on the town, the populace gained courage and attacked. On the 23rd, Badoglio unleashed death from the skies on his opponents. Planes swooped in, dropping not bombs, but poison gas. It hit Raz Imru's men on the Italian left. The mysterious liquid caused his men to burst out in boils all over their bodies. They rushed to the river, but it was contaminated as well. Soldiers, civilians, and animals writhed on the riverbank, unable to breathe. Raz Imru was at a loss. He said, quote, My chief surrounded me asking wildly what they should do. But I was completely stunned. I didn't know what to tell them. I didn't know how to fight this terrible rain that burned and killed." Unquote. On December 24th, Tito Meniti was flying over Harar on Ethiopia's southern front. What happened next is widely debated by historians. More than likely, his plane developed engine troubles and was forced to land on a barren stretch of desert. His co-pilot ran off into the desert and would be found dead some meters off. Miniti was then set upon by Ethiopians. Whether they were local nomads or soldiers remains a mystery. They allegedly dragged Miniti to a local village, shackled him to a tree, cut off his fingers, and castrated him. When he was dead, they allegedly mutilated his body, chopping off his head. There are issues with this account. There was only one eyewitness whose credibility was called into question. Additionally, it's impossible to surmise their cause of death as their remains were left to the elements and likely eaten by animals. Regardless, whatever truly happened to Miniti and his co-pilot, his ordeal led to the creation of effective propaganda for the Italian state. It proved to fascist propagandists that Italians were there to, quote, civilize a barbaric people, unquote. Graziani would swear vengeance against the Ethiopians for the supposed atrocity. And on December 30th, he began a devastating bombing campaign against the Southern Front. Amongst their targets was a Red Cross facility, where numerous international doctors and nurses were butchered by Italian bombs who actively targeted the hospital. In the south, Raz Desta's forces were launching an offensive into Italian Somaliland. Unfortunately, Italian scout planes had caught wise to their invasion march. Planes swooped down en masse on his 15,000 men. In a short time, only a beleaguered 5,000 remained. The only relief for the suffering Ethiopians was a Red Cross hospital. It was bombed mercilessly on Graziani's orders. Amongst the rain of death, leaflets fell, which read in Amharaic, quote, You have beheaded one of our airmen, infringing all human and international laws, under which prisoners are sacred and deserve respect. You will get what you deserve, unquote. Coming from Graziani, of all people, this is the absolute height of hypocrisy. Regardless, Graziani's air raid on Harar received serious international fallout, Bombing and gassing Ethiopians was all well and good, but attacking a hospital which housed European doctors was a bridge too far for the international community. Mussolini ordered his army to cease gas attacks for a time. Graziani was busy lying to his higher-ups about the bombing, saying Raz Desta's men were hiding inside the Red Cross area. Meanwhile, to the north, the Italians were putting Ethiopian citizens into concentration camps. These soon became overcrowded and filth-ridden. 
Even fascist guards complained to superiors about the prisoners' conditions. Something had to be done, so the Italian command decided that after a short stint at these, quote, mobile detention units, unquote, Ethiopians would be moved to larger facilities in Adwa or Makel. Finally, Ethiopian political prisoners made their way to one of two stops. James Pierce describes them thusly, quote, One was Nokra, a prison island in the Red Sea, and later there was Denane, a lonely stretch of field in Italian Somaliland, unquote. Thousands would be imprisoned by Italian authorities for any number of infractions. These camps were comparable in severity and lethality to Nazi war camps like Buchenwald and Dachau. Desta's mangled forces were still trying to push their way into Italian Somaliland. However, Graziani was manipulating his enemy the entire time. He used numerous bombing and gassing runs to corral his enemy into the perfect spot for annihilation. He continued to pulverize Ethiopian positions until January 12th, when he launched his attack. Armored cars, tanks, and Askari infantry crushed Ethiopian resistance. Seeing his command fall apart, Desta launched a desperate cavalry charge. The Italian tanks brushed the medieval cavalry aside while inflicting huge losses. This whole time, Graziani had been strategically denying his enemy water. As Ethiopian lines collapsed, all that anyone could think of was to have a drink. The closest water source was behind Italian machine gun emplacements. This was deliberate. Hundreds rushed forward begging for water, and they were met with a wave of machine gun fire which devastated the routed Ethiopians. 5,000 Ethiopian warriors began the Battle of Genale Doria. Only 1,000 would escape, alongside Ras Desta and his Belgian military advisors. These handful of bedraggled warriors made their way to Negeli to seek shelter. Graziani would give them not a moment's rest. Nageli was removed from the map by repeated bombing runs. Graziani arrived at the shell of the town he had destroyed and ordered a round of champagne. However, even in victory, Graziani was destined to play the fool. On one of the nights of battle, 900 elite Ascari soldiers defected. They were tired of the racism and of being treated like cannon fodder. They would fight on the Ethiopian side until liberation came in 1941. In another instance, around 100 Askari took to the hills after they were forced to bury Italian dead while their own dead were left to rot. In the north, Raz Mulugeta's army was holding the mountain top of Amba Aradam. Pietro Badoglio was incessantly bombing and gassing Ethiopian positions here. This caused little damage to the army, who could escape into mountain caves and defiles, but it caused immense damage to the livestock and fodder in the fields below. The Ethiopian army relied on these animals for supply. But Doglio still hadn't moved. He was worried his force would be swamped and divided by Raz Kassa and Raz Sayum. If achieved, this would allow Raz Imru to continue his offensive into Eritrea and completely surround the Italian army. This strategy was easier said than done. Ethiopian communications were archaic. It took a runner 14 days to get a message from the mountain peak to the Ethiopian right wing. To prevent any cohesive attack by the Ethiopians to his front, Badoglio attacked first. Askari troops, supported by black shirt militia, attempted a pincer movement on Raz Kassa. Ascari soldiers fought with bayonets for the hilltops of Casa's position. The next day, Italian units supported by blackshirt militias were pushing as well. However, they had overextended themselves. They decided to pull back and shore up their flanks, but it was too late. The Ethiopians were charging with reckless abandon on overextended fascist positions. The slaughter was on, and many a blackshirt was speared by vengeful Ethiopians. By day's end, the Italians were falling back all along the line, and over 350 black shirts were dead or dying. This supposed offensive by Badoglio had turned into a siege defense. James Pierce says, quote, Screaming battle cries, 
rushing barefoot toward the muzzle flash and roar of machine guns, the Ethiopians threw their numbers against the Italians, who were shocked and horrified as bodies literally piled up in front of them. And the Ethiopians didn't care. They jumped over corpses, swords flashing, spears finding their marks." Unquote. Italians were faltering all along the line. The Blackshirt Militia was completely surrounded, fighting a desperate defense against the Ethiopian human wave tactics. They were hoping the Ascari would save them, but for whatever reason, word did not get through. Las Casa could have crushed the Italians right here and now, but he needed to bolster his forces. Las Mulugeta was close by on his mountain stronghold. When asked to assist via radio, Mulugeta left Casa hanging to dry. Mulugeta was an unstable alcoholic who was likely upset that Casa was given overall command. If only he had acted, he could have been remembered as the hero of two massive Ethiopian victories. Instead, he let spite control his thinking to the detriment of his entire nation. Meanwhile, Badoglio was planning to evacuate the entire front. He still had countless men surrounded, literally dying of thirst. A relief column was finally dispatched to save the surrounded black shirts. The first battle of Tembien was over. It was determined to be an Ethiopian victory, and in many ways, it was. However, the Ethiopians had lost a staggering 8,000 men and an estimated 2,000 pack animals. Italians suffered over 1,100 casualties. This whole time, Ethiopian representatives were begging for basic supplies from the international community. What they wanted most were gas masks. But the League refused to supply them. Ethiopians were forced to create their own, diverting vital industrial resources to making and sewing thousands for their troops. Those without gas masks used a trick from the Great War. They would urinate in their cotton shamas and hold the fabric to their face and nose when the gas struck. Badoglio would not allow himself to be surprised again. He amassed an overwhelming force for his attack on Razmulugeta's mountain stronghold. There were seven divisions armed with 280 pieces of field artillery and over 170 planes. Following a massive bombardment, 70,000 Ascari Italian army and fascist militia marched to attack the flanks of the great mountain Amba Aradam. The weather was conspiring in the Ethiopians' favor and rain prevented the true assault for several days. This gave Italian artillery and aircraft more time to dispense their brutal form of civilization. In total, over 23,000 shells landed on Ethiopian positions while a further 4,000 bombs were dropped on them from the sky. Mulugeta refused to move or participate in an active defense. It was left to his underlings to show initiative. 4,000 Ethiopians valiantly held the line against two divisions of Italian attackers. If these men were to give way, the entire Ethiopian position would be cut off and surrounded. As the Ethiopians held, Italians were ambling up the sides of the mountain, tossing grenades into caves and making steady progress. By February 14th, Ethiopian resistance had been broken and the Italian flag waved on the mountain summit. At the cost of less than a thousand men, Badoglio had practically annihilated the Ethiopian army to his front, inflicting as many as 24,000 casualties on the Ethiopians. The one bright spot for Ethiopia was Raz Imru. Despite having the fewest men under his command and the worst equipment, he made the most progress of any Ethiopian army throughout the war. From his base in Shire, he pushed Italian outposts all the way to Aksum. In repeated raids and ambuscades, Ethiopian forces proved they were as capable as the highly equipped Italian army while utilizing far fewer resources. Meanwhile, Razmulugeta's broken force of 50,000 was retreating in disorder. They were harassed the whole time by an intense bombing campaign. Over a hundred tons of explosives were dropped on the retreating army. 
when they weren't dropping bombs, Italian aircraft were carpet gassing Ethiopians in terrifying numbers. It's estimated that 15,000 men in Mulugeta's army were killed by explosives or gas attacks during this retreat. Reaching the village of Maichu, Mulugeta was set upon not only by the Italian Air Force, but also by local brigands who were constantly harassing his shattered force. These brigands were usually in the pay of Italy, but not always. On February 27th, News reached Mulugeta that his son was dead, killed by Italian aircraft, and his body was looted by bandits. In a rage, Mulugeta rushed to his side. It is unknown if he was killed by bandits or by Italian aircraft. Either way, he fell dead over the body of his son. Those still alive collected themselves for the retreat to Korem, where they hoped to link up with the emperor's army. Bedoglio had dispatched Mulugeta. Now he had to crush the threat to his flank from Raz Kassa and Raz Seyum. He would squeeze the two armies in a death vice. The Askari, as usual, would attack from the front, while the black shirts would get the easier and more glorious job of sweeping behind the Ethiopians. The emperor was begging his commanders to retreat and save their fighting forces. For whatever reason, the two decided to stand and fight, probably concluding it would be better to hold the Italians here rather than somewhere else further back. As we have seen, this was faulty reasoning. They were applying 19th century warfare to the modern world, and their lack of air power meant their supposedly impregnable mountain position was easily bombarded by land and air. The Ethiopians had no means of response, the soldiers were expected to grin and bear it until the enemy showed their face. This had a highly negative effect on Ethiopian morale, so when the Italians launched a surprise morning attack on their positions, Ethiopians fled in abject terror. Raz Kassa attempted to rally his forces and launch a counterattack. They charged and broke many blackshirt units, but the Escari were there to save the Italians from themselves. The Second Battle of Tambien had begun. Ethiopians were charging the mountain pass once more. This time, Italian aircraft were on hand to support, and they dropped a devastating 200 tons on Ethiopian positions. It was hopeless. The early gains of the Italians made Ethiopian positions untenable. In the chaos of retreat, Ethiopian wounded were abandoned at a Red Cross facility where they were promptly executed by Italians. Another 8,000 Ethiopians were killed, while fewer than 500 Italians and their native allies were wounded or killed. Bombed and harried the whole way, the once great force which Kassa and Seyum commanded was a shell of its former self. Out of the six Ethiopian armies that began the war, four were mangled wrecks, and the last two belonged to the emperor and Raz Imru. Imru, against his better judgment, decided to meet an Italian offensive with a traditional battle before retreating. 10,000 men were assembled for such a purpose. The Italians amassed 47,000 to dispatch the men arrayed against them. Black shirts marched confidently from their bases. They had such an overwhelming advantage with their numbers, they felt no need to deploy forward scouts. This proved fatal for the first few lines of blackshirt militia who stumbled upon Ethiopian positions and were decimated. The Italian commander was at a loss. How were only 10,000 arrayed against him? He tried to move forward again, but his troops were pounced on by counterattacking Ethiopians once more. However, Italian artillery and aircraft proved too overwhelming, and Imru's men were forced to fall back over the Takaze River. Italians burned the thousands of Ethiopian dead with flamethrowers rather than take the time to bury them. The Battle of Shire was over. The road was clear for an Italian advance deep into Ethiopia. As Nazis swarmed into the Rhineland, Italians marched along the road to Addis Ababa. Haile Selassie was in the field with his imperial army. He must have realized his country's official resistance was nearing its end. They could smell the distinct odor of horseradish, which meant the mustard gas was about to permeate their lungs. 
The Italians clearly knew where Selassie was, and they were attempting to punish him at every turn. Unfortunately, thousands of civilian Ethiopians were also in the area. Marcel Junod was there with the Red Cross, and he witnessed a horrifying sight. Coming over a hill, there must have been at least a thousand Ethiopians writhing in agony on the ground. They were all victims of mustard gas. They cried, quote, Abiet, Abiet, which is Ethiopian for have pity, unquote. In the south, the butcher of Fezan had been resting on his laurels and had not advanced after suffering a bloody nose following the destruction of Raz Desta's army. He was now being pestered by Mussolini to attack Harar, considered by some to be Islam's fourth holy city. In response, Graziani unleashed his bombers on the ancient city. It was practically annihilated as it had no anti-aircraft defenses and was not home to any military installations. It was a ruthless attack against a purely civilian target, and it would come to define the new era of aerial warfare. One place which suffered ruthless attacks was the Orthodox Cathedral, where the remains of Haile Selassie's father were interred. Ethiopian hopes now rested on the weather. If their forces could hold out a few more weeks, the rain would turn the country into an impassable quagmire. In the hopes of saving his country's fortunes, Haile Selassie decided to launch an attack on Italian positions in Maichu. Russian military advisors informed the emperor that Italian defenses were weak there. Upon arriving, the supposedly weak defenses were greatly reinforced. As it would turn out, the Russian officer who advised the emperor ended up working for fascist Spain during their civil war. Regardless of the enhanced defenses, Haile Selassie's 30,000 would attempt to pierce the Italian position. He would have little artillery, zero air support, and no radio communications. On top of this, there were serious delays in executing the planned offensive. First, they had to wait for more men to arrive. Then they had to wait for a piece of artillery. Then they threw a feast. And then they held a council of war. The Italians knew the attack was coming by this point, so the emperor should have retreated. Instead, he attacked. In the morning, a Mauser pistol and a red rocket signaled the beginning of the Ethiopian offensive. Thousands died attempting to assault Italian machine gun emplacements. The one bright spot was Ethiopian anti-air fire. Out of 70 Italian planes deployed, 37 were shot down by Orlikans, one of which was manned by the Emperor himself. Seeing stalemate at his front, the Emperor decided to strike the Italian left with his elite Imperial Guard. They rushed forward and captured Italian positions before losing them and then recapturing them once more. But the Ethiopian offensive had no staying power and was doomed to fail. Oromo tribesmen, disloyal to Ethiopia on the best day, decided at the crucial moment of battle to defect to the Italian side. It was the final stand of the Ethiopian nation which was on the brink of collapse. The emperor pleaded with his commanders to disperse into the country and continue the war from there. His bedraggled army, now tailed by Italians the whole way, attempted to consolidate itself at Korem. Along the way, the army devolved into a frightened mass of men, women, and children, and animals, fleeing to any place of sanctuary. Haile Selassie had to admit the sad truth. He said, quote, It is beyond our power to hold them back. Unquote. His ramshackled army limped to Lalibela, an ancient city designed to mirror Jerusalem in aesthetic. He stopped to pray in the ancient monastery built to give sanctuary to the persecuted Christians of yesteryear. Traveling south, they passed Magdala, where a previous Ethiopian emperor committed suicide rather than yield to British might. In Addis Ababa, the fall of the capital was seemingly imminent, but Doglio's forces were marching unopposed on the capital, issuing proclamations the whole time. 
One read, quote, We bring peace and civilization, but if you destroy our roads or try to oppose the advance of my army, then the Italian army will destroy you without pity. The airplanes will massacre you from the air and destroy everything that exists. Unquote. In the South, Graziani was being ponderously slow in the face of virtually no opposition. Harar and Gigiga lay defenseless, and Graziani had at least 10,000 more men at his disposal, not to mention trucks, planes, and artillery. However, the Ethiopians here, alongside their Turkish military advisors, put up a serious resistance to any and all Italian advances. They eventually proved no match in the face of a concerted push. Graziani was attempting to one-up his rival, Badoglio. He wanted to reach Harar before the latter reached Addis Ababa. Badoglio was planning to roll into the capital in a triumphant Roman style. He equipped a massive force of armored vehicles to follow his advances into Ethiopia's heartland, where the smell of death permeated the air, and thousands of gassed Ethiopian citizens and animals lay dead on the ground. This became known as the, quote, March of the Iron Will, unquote. Addis Ababa was devolving into a state of violent conflagration. Ferengi, or foreigners, were shot on sight by roving bands of Ethiopians, while numerous shops and businesses were looted. Hundreds died in the anarchy which reigned. Haile Selassie now realized all was lost. He believed his best way forward was to escape the country, and garner support for the resistance abroad. This was viewed as shameful by some Ethiopians. They felt that if the emperor left, it would be a dishonor to their country's traditions. One officer handed the emperor his pistol and asked if he wasn't the son of Theodois. This was the emperor who chose suicide rather than submission. Some others felt the emperor should continue the fight in the country until the bitter end some even contemplating assassinating the elect of God before he would be able to escape Ethiopia. In the end, Haile Selassie probably felt it more prudent to come back to fight another day rather than die uselessly or, worse, be made a prisoner of Italian occupiers. The emperor nearly backed down at the last moment. His wife had to convince him to leave with her and their children. The imperial family would catch a train, which would take them to Djibouti, after which they would take a boat ride, which would take them to England, where the emperor and his family would live in exile until the promised day of reckoning. Haile Selassie's nation had to meekly submit itself to Italy. Mussolini had already authorized a policy of terror and extermination against Ethiopian so-called rebels. The rebels would say, when asked about a captured comrade, that they were, quote, taken to Rome, unquote. The emperor felt his last hope lay in the League of Nations. After all this time, he still believed in the League's promise to come to the aid of smaller nations experiencing military aggression. He would travel directly to the League's headquarters in Geneva and beseech the delegates of 50 nations to help. Upon arriving in Geneva... There were a dozen roadblocks and political hurdles he and his entourage had to overcome. The Hungarian and Swiss delegation didn't want him to speak at all. However, it was felt that if they denied the emperor, it would hurt the League's credibility even more. So, they gave him permission to speak on June 30th, 1936. The emperor approached the rostrum and was met with a tidal wave of whistles and boos. The Italian delegation and press were acting like a pack of wild baboons. The emperor maintained his composure, but the Italians would not remain quiet. They had to be forcibly removed from the premises before the emperor was allowed to speak. He said, quote, I, Haile Selassie I, emperor of Ethiopia, am here today to claim that justice, which is due to my people, and the assistance promised to it eight months ago, when 50 nations asserted that aggression had been committed in violation of international treaties. There is no precedent for a head of state himself speaking in this assembly, but 
There is also no precedent for a people being victim of such injustice and being at present threatened by abandonment to its aggressor. Unquote. He went on to summarize events thus far, speaking on Italian aggression and the lethality of the poison gases they were using. He condemned the French government and the Hoare Laval Pact, saying that it was a complete breach of the League's covenant. He concluded, quote, I renew my protest against the violations of treaties of which the Ethiopian people has been the victim. I declare in the face of the whole world that the emperor, the government, and the people of Ethiopia will not bow before force, that they maintain their claims, that they will use all means in their power to ensure the triumph of right and the respect of the covenant. I ask the 52 nations who have given the Ethiopian people a promise to help them in their resistance to the aggressor, what are they willing to do for Ethiopia? And the great powers who have promised the guarantee of collective security to small states, on whom weighs the threat that they may one day suffer the fate of Ethiopia, I ask, what measures do you intend to take? Representatives of the world, I have come to Geneva to discharge in your midst the most painful of duties of the head of a state. What reply shall I take back to my people? It is us today. It will be you tomorrow. Unquote. On May 5, 1936, a grand procession of tanks, armored cars, and cavalry rolled into Addis Ababa. Upon many tanks were the words, Ethiopia e Fenite. The Second Italo-Ethiopian War had come to an unofficial conclusion. The occupation of Ethiopia would bring with it horror and death. Roman civilization and empire was brought to Ethiopia at the end of a bayonet and in the back of a squalid jail cell. Italians would remain in Ethiopia for another five years. As war wound down in Ethiopia, a new war was coming to Spain. The leftist republicans supported by Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union were fighting a terrifying war of attrition with the fascist nationalists, who were supported by Germany and Italy. Spanish fascism was uniquely clerical, but its inception gave weight to the idea that fascism had universal applications across the world. Tens of thousands of Italians would fight on both sides of the Spanish Civil War. The Italian government sent numerous tanks and airplanes to the nationalists, while Italians who went to volunteer for the Republicans were stripped of their citizenship. George Orwell was one of thousands of foreigners who fought on the Republican side. He describes the abortive attack on Huesca by thousands of Italian Republicans who were decimated by nationalist machine guns in his book, Homage to Catalonia. 1937, about a year into Italian occupation, Ethiopia was clearly suffering from fascist overlordship. In spite of supposed Italian control, guerrilla bands led by fearless Ethiopian men, women, and children took the fight to their fascist colonizers. These Ethiopian patriots fought in numerous raids and small actions. They succeeded in many circumstances at curtailing Italian power. Back in London, black activists and their allies were keeping the news from Ethiopia alive. One of these allies was Sylvia Pankhurst. She ran a weekly expose on the crimes of Italian fascism in Ethiopia and was close friends with the exiled emperor. Her voice proved crucial to bolstering support from white people who likely would have otherwise been passive about the plight of Ethiopians. In Ethiopia, there were rebel cells and individual forms of resistance too numerous to count. They were met with what Dennis Mack Smith called a, quote, ten eye for one, unquote, approach by Italian colonizers. In the most infamous reprisal attack, Yekatit 12, 
upwards of 17,000 innocent Ethiopians were butchered by Italian forces in and around Addis Ababa, following a grenade attack which nearly killed Graziani. Amongst the rebel leaders was Jegemo Kello, who began his career as a freedom fighter at 14. By the time he was 16, he was leading a force of 3,000 men and was known across Ethiopia as the, quote, child general, unquote. These patriots would fight without support from the outside world for years, crippling Italian supply lines, engendering paranoia in Italian garrisons, and even setting up the functions of local government in the several provinces in which the patriots were in de facto control. Early in 1938, Mussolini begrudgingly complied with the Anschluss of Austria. This removed many of the impediments that had prevented Italian and German friendship. The relative ease with which Ethiopia fell falsely puffed the head of Mussolini. He now believed his armed forces were near invincible and would be able to hold their own against France and Great Britain. However, Mussolini failed to see that the relative ease with which he quote-unquote conquered Ethiopia was largely due to the lack of technology in Ethiopia, rather than Italian proficiencies in war-making. Additionally, the Ethiopian occupation had cost Italy upwards of 40 billion lire. It also drew Italy inexorably towards the German Reich. In May 1938, Italy formally withdrew from the League of Nations and placed itself firmly on the highway to ruin. A year previous, Italian authorities began to crack down on interracial relationships, making it a crime punishable by up to five years in prison. In 1938, the same year Italy exited the League, they introduced defined racial laws, further segregating black and Semitic peoples. Under the direction of Mussolini, fascist so-called scientists were busy making a stunning revelation about the Italian people. Somehow, they came to the conclusion that the peninsula, which had been conquered by the Spanish, the French, the Arabs, the Normans, the Greeks, the Albanians, the Phoenicians, and the Mongols, was solely made up of a, quote, purely Nordic Aryan race. <laughs> oh. Dennis Mack Smith concludes, quote, The fact a dictator could suddenly change his mind and decree that this much-conquered Italian peninsula was inhabited by a pure race must have given the more intelligent fascists something to ponder. But perhaps by this time, there were not many intelligent fascists left. Unquote. In 1939, Italy and Germany would cement their relationship by signing the Pact of Steel. In a speech, Mussolini would claim the world now revolved around the quote-unquote axis of Italy and Germany. The name stuck and the Axis powers were born. They would soon grow to include the Empire of Japan. Mussolini said he wanted peace with the Allies and he was, quote, extending an olive branch, unquote. This olive branch, he said, was protruding from a forest of, quote, eight million bayonets, unquote. For someone who wanted peace, Mussolini had a strange way of showing it. State expenditures devoted to the military reached 60 million lire a year, which outpaced state revenue by over 50%. This deficit would double once war began and only worsen as Italian cities were bombed. Mussolini's foreign policy was proven detrimental on the home front. The cost of living for the average Italian had gone up by over 30%. In April of 1939, Italy invaded and occupied Albania, following a short but decisive fight with Albanian armed forces. It had hitherto existed as an Italian puppet state, so this invasion made little sense. The invasion occurred during a period of increased tension across the globe. What is today Chechia was annexed directly to Germany, 
while former Bishop Joseph Tizo proclaimed that Slovakia would operate as a fascist puppet state. That September, Germany invaded Poland and the Second World War erupted in Europe. It had already been raging in Ethiopia since 1935 and in China since 1932. This came as a shock to Mussolini. He was not at all prepared for this general war. The 10 million men he claimed to have under arms were actually 10 divisions. With that in mind, he declared quote-unquote non-belligerence in the conflict. Hitler was furious. He said that Italy was acting awfully like Italy of World War I. To counter these accusations, Mussolini said in a speech that he was only looking to maintain quote, peace based on justice, unquote, in Europe. As it turns out, the German Fuhrmacht did not need Italian support. Their armies easily swept through Poland in a matter of weeks. Next, they conquered Denmark and Norway. The former fell in 24 hours. When Hitler invaded the lowlands and then plunged panzers deep through the Ardennes forest, it seemed France was on the brink of collapse. With their capitulation imminent, Mussolini feared the war would be over before Italy had gained any quote-unquote prestige. He said, quote, I only need a few thousand dead so I can sit at the peace conference as a man who has fought, unquote. On June 10th, Italy declared war on France and Great Britain. An army of 300,000 was ready at the mountain border of France and Italy. These troops were ordered to only begin their advance when Paris had fallen and France was asking for peace terms. Regardless, their offensive was an unmitigated disaster. When peace between the Axis and France was declared, Italy had lost 4,000 men, gained no territory, and inflicted just 100 casualties on the French. It was a sign of things to come, to be sure. In spite of this ignominious beginning, Mussolini believed he had a supreme strategic plan. He would overwhelm the Allied forces in Africa, driving them from Libya and Ethiopia in a grand pincer movement. If achieved, this would sever the vital link Great Britain had with its Indian colonies, the Suez Canal. At the same time, he was planning an invasion of Greece, which he hoped would bring about a new, quote, Italian sphere of influence, unquote, ranging from Spain across the Mediterranean into Palestine and the Middle East. Now that he was in the fight, Mussolini did all he could to include Italian arms in German operations. Christopher Duggan says, quote, Mussolini pressed Hitler to be allowed to take part in the invasion of Britain, and even sent 300 aircraft to Belgium to help with the bombing of London. The Germans soon sent them back when they discovered how out of date they were. Unquote. Hitler begged Mussolini to focus his resources on North Africa and try to break through there. Instead, on October 28th, Mussolini declared war against the Kingdom of Greece, launching 162,000 men at Greek mountain defenses from Italian bases in Albania. Additionally, Mussolini launched his first of many air raids on Malta in the middle of June. For the next two years, over 2,000 Italian and German planes would launch thousands of attacks on the beleaguered island. Malta would prove an unbreakable rock and was nicknamed, quote, Britain's unsinkable carrier, unquote. The island resisted and fought back, sinking 72% of the Italian transport fleet and 23% of the German transport fleet. In total, 17,000 Axis Sea and airmen were killed. On the Allied side, over 1,000 civilians died in bombing runs, while over 2,000 Allied airmen were killed in the island's defense. In North Africa, Italo Balbo was preparing an offensive aimed at Egypt and the Suez Canal. He had over 200,000 men at his command. In East Africa, the Duke of Aosta had 110,000 men aimed at capturing British Somaliland and then moving on to Kenya and Sudan. The British, under the command of Sir Archibald Wavell, had fewer than 70,000 men when the war began. They were spread out over all of British Africa, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean. 
Replacing Italo Balbo as head of Italian forces in Libya was Rodolfo Graziani. He advanced into Egypt with five divisions on September 13th. British forces gave way before him and fell back to the defenses at Mursa Matru. Graziani considered this advance successful, and he hunkered down to resupply. Wavell was forced to send away several thousand men for the defense of Crete. This delayed his planned offensive against the Italians. By December, however, Wavell was ready to attack. He sent 31,000 men supported by artillery and tanks to the teeth of the Italian defenses. These forces ripped a gaping hole in the Italian line, throwing them out of Egypt entirely. 38,000 Italians were made prisoner, an astonishing number considering the British didn't even have that many men. On top of this, they captured vast amounts of supplies and war material. What made this offensive all the more extraordinary was that at the same time, Wavell was launching an offensive into Ethiopia from Sudan. On the Greek-Albanian border, Italian offensives were ground to a halt by the well-led Greek army under the command of Alexander Papagos. Our Ernest and Trevor N. Dupuy say the Greeks, quote, disposed themselves in highly organized defensive zones through the difficult mountainous border area, unquote. Greek units now took the offensive and rolled up Italian opposition. They were greatly aided in their attacks by the Royal Air Force, which smothered the Italians. The British were showing themselves able at maintaining multiple fronts. They moved to the seas, where Andrew Cunningham's Mediterranean fleet was causing havoc for the Italian Royal Navy. Off the coast of Calabria, Cunningham's fleet impetuously moved on the Italians, severely injuring several Italian naval vessels. He attacked once more at Taranto, where he proved the efficacy of air power in naval combat. His surprise attack on the Italian fleet left a half-dozen vessels sunk or sinking. As 1941 began, more embarrassment would befall Italian armed forces. 1941 was a crucial year for both the Allies and the Axis powers. America began its unofficial involvement in the conflict, helping to garrison Iceland, declaring a protectorate over Greenland, and beginning the Lend-Lease program. American convoy ships went out in their thousands to supply British and free French forces with American equipment. Germany would not allow this. They began openly attacking U.S. shipping. It was clear the United States would soon have to involve itself militarily in the conflict. In North Africa, Wavell's offensive resumed with the new year, they crashed through inept Italian defenses and forced the capitulation of Tobruk on January 22nd. The genius of Wavell didn't stop there. Simultaneously, his offensive in Ethiopia was easily swamping Italians. This offensive was helped along by the massive rebel movement there, which was constantly harassing Italian forces. Their contribution is hardly referenced. Instead, the professionalism of the South African army, which participated in the majority of the unit-to-unit -unit fighting, is glorified. Without a doubt, these men fought bravely against an Italian garrison which was much larger. But without the Ethiopian resistance, the fighting would have likely ground to stalemate and attrition. It could have diverted crucial resources from other theaters and required years of battle. As it stood, fighting in Ethiopia lasted a grand total of four months. Wavell's two-headed grand offensive was working magnificently. R. Ernest and Trevor N. Dupuy said about the 1941 North African campaign, quote, In two months' time, the British advanced 500 miles, destroyed nine Italian divisions, and taken 130,000 prisoners. British casualties amounted to 500 killed and 1,300 wounded. Wavell's spearhead may have continued all the way to Tripoli, but he was forced to pause his assault and send yet more men to Greece, where the war was heating up in a major way. Germany was demanding Yugoslavia join the Axis, or else. Patriotic Yugoslavians rose up against their king and refused any cooperation with the Nazis. 
Hitler was now preparing to remove what he considered a, quote, Slavic blot, unquote, on the map. In North Africa, Hitler realized the perilous situation the Italians were facing. He dispatched one of his top generals. Erwin Rommel had, to this point, become a highly decorated officer, but he had yet to yield a substantial number of men. His 7th Panzer Division was draped in glory following his rapid circumvention of French defenses during the Battle for France. Rommel did this largely against orders, and his forces were responsible for numerous atrocities against French Senegalese troops. The commanders Rommel fought against raved about him, and following the rupture of Germany, West Germany needed a new founding father figure. Rommel was chosen as this figurehead, largely because of his involvement in an assassination attempt against Hitler toward the end of the war. Historian Salandra Maas calls this altered image of Rommel a, quote, hero cult, unquote. Alongside the romantization of Rommel's character, his military acumen seems above question, but David T. Zabecki considers him overrated, stating that his ambitious tactical achievements were not backed up with proper supply and therefore led to overall strategic defeat in North Africa. All in all, Rommel was an above-average tactician, but he was regardless a Nazi commander. In North Africa, he used Jewish Libyans as mine clearers, sending them forward under penalty of death. He also enslaved Jewish people and assisted the SS in the confiscation of Jewish property and assets throughout Libya. It is largely due to Rommel that thousands of Jewish Libyans were sent to Eastern European work camps. These atrocities were committed under his authority, and that makes him as responsible as the private who ransacked the Jewish business or ran down a Senegalese soldier with his tank. Regardless, Rommel's arrival would change the shape of the North African campaign. From El Agalia, his offensive drove British units 360 miles to the Egyptian border. Rommel's offensive, however, failed to capture Tobruk. As we have discussed, Tobruk is one of the great natural harbors in the Mediterranean. The city was held by a combination of units and bolstered by Australian reinforcements. With Tobruk still in Allied hands, Rommel's supply situation was beyond precarious. Wavell was now in a political corner as well. He needed a successful counteroffensive or he would be replaced. His piecemeal attack against German positions was thwarted easily, and he was replaced by Claude Auchinleck. In reality, Wavell was a pawn in the failure which was British intervention in Greece. The Balkans were on fire once more, and Hitler's invasion of Yugoslavia was swift and devastating. The country was never able to fully mobilize its armies and was effectively swamped on four fronts by German, Bulgarian, Italian, and Romanian armies. The remnants of the Yugoslav state scattered into the hills, and there began a resistance movement. In time, this resistance movement would devolve into a three-way war between the Axis, the Chetniks, and the Communist Partisans. German panzers continued their unholy crusade, crashing into Greek defenses and utterly swamping them. British units barely had time to get ready before they were withdrawn once more. The Greek army stayed behind and fought until the British were safely away and then capitulated. Germany had swamped Greece in less than a month, at the cost of 4,500 casualties. They inflicted almost 12,000 casualties on the British, 70,000 on the Greeks, and captured over 270,000 prisoners of war. Crete was next to fall. Following a bloody landing by German paratroopers, the Allied defenses on the island collapsed. Altogether, the Balkan campaigns were disastrous for the Allies, but more so for Italy. The country was absolutely disgraced by its army's performance. Against the small nation of Greece, 
Italian forces lost over 100,000 men in just five months of fighting. The only place Italian forces were achieving success was in North Africa, where they were directed by German officers. In November, Auchinleck's offensive began with a surprise attack on Italo-German garrisons around Solum and Bardia. In a series of decisive tank battles, British preponderance won against the poorly supplied Axis forces. Rommel was forced to retreat all the way to his original strategic position of Elagalia, leaving the garrison of Bardia and Halfaya to their fate. In total, over 50,000 Axis soldiers were killed, wounded, or captured. British losses were less than half that. On the seas, the Italian navy was being trounced by the enterprising British fleet. Following the Battle of Cape Matapan, Italian naval power was totally crippled and would remain docked in La Spezia for the rest of the war. However, Italian human torpedoes, which look exactly as they sound, were making waves. Three teams of these small submarines entered Alexandria Harbor on December 19, 1941. They succeeded in severely damaging two massive British battleships. This hindered British naval dominance in the area. What's more impressive is that all three teams of Italians survived to tell the tale. That June, Germany declared war on the Soviet Union and began a vast offensive along a massive front. From Finland to Ukraine and Moldavia, war raged and Soviet armies disintegrated. In December, Imperial Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and invaded the Philippines and British Malaya. America was now a full-on belligerent in the conflict. Before they could exert their full weight, Rommel was attempting to swing the pendulum back in his favor in North Africa. He launched a late winter offensive, rolling up British units until they made a stand at Gazala. Both sides build up their forces for the coming battle. Rommel had the superiority in manpower, while the Allies had the superiority in the skies and in tanks. Rommel planned to envelop the British left, which was protected by the vast deserts of the south. British and German tanks fought furiously for an inland crossroads called Knight's Bridge, while Italian infantry weaved its way through a traverse of minefields to attack British lines at Bur Hakam. Rommel was now able to supply his tanks who were threatening the British position. British commanders pulled their forces back rather than face encirclement. The British fell back into Egypt once more, but in their retreat, Tobruk fell. This vital supply hub allowed Rommel the means he needed to acquire his end. By the start of July, Allied positions were in complete disarray. They had lost 70,000 men, while Italo-German attackers lost over 40,000. Auchinleck was forced out and replaced with Bernard Monty Montgomery. Monty believed in three things, planning, planning, and then more planning after that. The Allied army in North Africa was reaching its zenith. It numbered 150,000 men by October, and they were bolstered by over 1,000 tanks. Rommel, meanwhile, had barely 96,000 at his disposal and 600 tanks. Everything was lacking for the Axis, while the Allies enjoyed a great excess. Monty was putting the finishing touches on his masterpiece. On October 23, 1942, a 1,000 British artillery pieces began an accurate and pre-planned bombardment of Axis positions. Under a full moon, the Allies pushed the Axis left, but Italian infantry was holding stubbornly. German panzers rushed to halt the attack and stymied it for a time. Monty now threw all his weight against breaking the coastal defenses in the north. Australian and British attackers fought for a week over these minefields. The armor of both armies was committed here, in repeated engagements, the superior numbers of British tanks were besting the qualitatively better German tanks. Australian infantry had nearly captured the only connecting road to which Rommel had access, so he rapidly deployed his reserves and attempted to recover the situation. Monty regrouped, realized his attack here would get him nowhere, and ordered the attack resumed in the south. 
New Zealand infantry partially broke through the desert, facing defenses around Kidney Hill. Rommel sent his few remaining tanks there to try and hold, but it was useless. By the night of November 2nd, the Axis had fewer than 35 operational tanks remaining. Rommel decided to withdraw rather than be annihilated. He made sure to pull his Afrika Corps out first, leaving the Italians behind. It was an abject defeat for the Axis and a turning point in World War II. Rommel had lost over 50% of his army, sustaining over 59,000 casualties, while the British lost 13,000. R. Ernest and Trevor N. Dupuy concluded, quote, The victory saved the Suez Canal was a curtain raiser for the Anglo-American invasion of North Africa four days later and was a prelude to the debacle of Stalingrad. Unquote. The desert fox was skinned and forced on the defensive for the rest of the war. Across North Africa, American landings were met with success in every sector. Following the destruction of most of the Vichy French forces in Algeria, the race for Tunisia began between Allied and Axis commanders. Brought in to lead Italian forces was Giovanni Messi, largely considered one of the best Italian commanders throughout the war. That being said, he is most known for retreating very well. Previously, he had led Italian expeditionary forces in Russia, where Italian troops numbered over 250,000. By the end of the Eastern Campaign, almost half of these would be dead, missing, captured, or injured. In Tunisia, his lightning movements and fighting withdrawals would outpace General Patton, who was the king of movement. He frustrated American armor time and again when they attempted to encircle Axis positions. By April of 1943, Allied forces were ready for the final grand thrust into Tunisia, designed to crush the Italo-German presence in North Africa forever. The battle for Tunisia began on May 3rd, following an intense aerial and land-based bombardment. The Allies penetrated the Axis positions. Over the next 10 days, 275,000 Italian and German soldiers would surrender, crushing the dreams of Benito Mussolini. The Second Roman Empire was dead on arrival. As American and British forces landed in Sicily, the decision was made on July 25th to remove Mussolini from power. Only now that all was lost and mainland Italy lay in the scopes of avenging Allied armies, did the king step in and formally appoint Pietro Badoglio as the country's new prime minister. He endeavored to seek a separate favorable peace with the Allies. Mussolini was placed under arrest, but German forces endeavored to recapture him and make him work like a puppet for their interests. During Operation Alaric, German units in Italy took over the country and its functions. They would attempt to hold every inch of the peninsula, turning the valleys and hills of Italy into killing zones. In the penultimate episode of this series, we'll discuss the liberation of Italy, the beginning of the Italian partisan movement, and the beginning of a new republic for the Italian people. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. The repercussions of the Second Italo-Ethiopian War are still being felt. Graziani and Badoglio are celebrated figures in Italy to this day. Graziani's hometown is even home to a monument for the butcher of Fezzan. He was never formally accused of war crimes, nor forced to stand trial for his numerous atrocities in Libya and Ethiopia. And these people were never given much reparations for the loss they suffered at the hands of despotic, imperialist European powers. They are not included in school history books when they speak of the atrocities committed during World War II and during the reign of fascism and Nazism. History cannot be swept under the rug. These are real people who really suffered and their suffering deserves to be acknowledged by the governments and countries who perpetrated these violent, callous acts against them. War criminals should not be celebrated, and they should not have statues and monuments dedicated to their heroism. 
it is necessary to learn about history in its entirety. Otherwise, we risk repeating the atrocious actions or not recognizing the atrocities when they are being played out right in front of our faces. I'm your host, Joseph Pescone. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Turning Tides. And please, when you see people being treated unjustly, speak up. If everyone throughout history believed their one voice did not matter, we wouldn't have this much to talk about. Thank you all again. If you like what you heard today, you can support us by donating on PayPal at Turning Tides Podcast One. Thanks for the support and thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, we'd really appreciate it if you take the time to rate and review Turning Tides on whatever platform you use to listen and share the show on social media. It really helps us to bring the show to more listeners. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to everyone for listening. We'd also like to say thank you to Movo Photo. We use their sound equipment for this podcast, as well as all of our other projects at Antics Entertainment. They make great equipment at great prices, and we really appreciate that they make content creating so accessible for indie creators like us. Check them out on social media at Movo Photo, M-O-V-O-P-H-O-T-O. Thank you again.